want to stop talking about that. <laughs> we just want to examine what they're suggesting. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Is it on the internet? No. No. It's not in the email. They want us to make a phone call. Okay, make, you got to make the phone call. Yeah. You know, I'm so like in my white life. I'm so lucky. I love it. Good morning and welcome to our church at study. In this quarter, we'll take a look at the book of Hebrews. Imagine a portrait of Jesus and in this portrait, it will capture the breadth, length, height and depth of God's love for us. May the image of Jesus as portrayed in Hebrews capture not just our gaze, but our love and admiration for yes, Jesus, our brother in heaven. Our teachers have studied and prepared for this week's lesson. They're prepared to be interactive. As we're here in the building, we'd like for you to come to the mic and interact. Also, feel free to chat at home. Ask all the questions that you have. Now, we'll turn it over to our teachers. We're so glad that you have joined us once again as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. And today we have another, another exciting lesson on the promised son. Shall we invite God's presence to be with us? Oh, kind Father, thank you. Thank you that you have allowed us this opportunity and this medium to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that as we delve into this subject of the great promise that was made to mankind, the promised son, that we too, oh God, would appreciate what a great a gift Heaven has made for mankind. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Welcome again as we delve into the word today. First, what is the theme of this lesson? We are still in Hebrews, the first chapter, and that is introducing um, Jesus. How Paul saw Jesus and introducing Jesus. The focus of this lesson is looking forward to the coming Redeemer. We're looking forward to the coming Redeemer. Man, humans have always looked forward to the coming Redeemer. First, Adam and Eve were looking for <coughs> the seed in Genesis 15. They thought that the seed would be Cain, their first child, but that was not really the seed. Abraham was given the promise through his son Isaac. Next, David was promised a son who, if faithful to God, would establish uh, forever. However, none of these people thought that God himself would be the promised redeemer. The prophets in the Old Testament sometimes talk about the latter days, but um, it was Jesus, it was the coming of Jesus that caused the latter days to arrive. So, t so today we're going to look at the, the last days. We're going to look at what's spoken to us by the Son. Um, God has given his Son to speak to us the brightness of his glory. We're still in Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. God has in the last days spoken to us by his son. Let's move to Sunday's lesson of the Rodriguez. Sunday's lesson is uh, the Bible usage of the last days and the latter days. I love how Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, 20 makes this point. In the latter days, you will understand it Perfectly. Ha! It's almost like it's a prelogue to the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> so we know that the latter days is something that is referenced often in the Word of God. And it begs the question when are the latter days? 
So we can look at this a uh, couple of different ways, perhaps others, but consider that our time in this earth is marked by the arrival and the living and the death of one Jesus Christ. So if we were not even reading the Bible, we would say, well, the latter days are before he came, and uh, the latter days now are when he has arrived. Let's also think about Bible prophecy. All the prophecies in the Old Testament were pointing towards a Savior to come. So as they referenced the latter days, they were referencing the arrival of the Messiah, the one Son of God. As Dr. Carrington said, Adam was given a promise, and then Abraham as well. And then David was told that there would be a son that would come to fulfill the promise. None of them, I have to say, thought that it would be the son of God. And so when Joel says, in the latter days, I will pour out my spirit, we can sense that this is the beginning of the latter days. Now, Peter, in 1 Peter 1 and 20 also says that these days were foreordained. It reads, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Uh, also, Paul speaks about the latter days. In the last days, says uh, God, I will pour out my spirit on all my flesh, just what we reference from the book of Joel. And we know there are examples of how the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost when they were given supernatural ability to speak other languages so that those who were in Jerusalem could hear the gospel in their own, uh, in their own language. And so now, Hebrews the first chapter and the first verse says, God, who at various time and in various ways spoke in times past to the Father by the prophets, verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the world. So Hebrews says the arrival of Jesus is the latter or the last days. There are certain prophecies that were made about Jesus in the Old Testament that came to pass in the New Testament. Paul referenced some of those. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14, it says, For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, which by no means precedes those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there is also an expression in the word of God that Daniel used talking about the end of time. I might say the latter of the latter days, <laughs> the last of the last days. And in these times, which were preceded or, or began by the prophecy of Daniel that we'll talk about in a minute, there are certain promises and realities that we are, as believers, are going to be able to experience. So in the last days, Jesus was resurrected. In the end of time, on the last of the last days, we'll be resurrected, praise the Lord. In the last days, we were made new creatures by accepting the gospel. In the end of time, God will make a new creation, which we will be a part of. <coughs> In the last days, the kingdom of God is among us, talking about the arrival of Jesus Christ. But in the end of time, the eternal kingdom will be established. So these are exciting days, if you will. The Bible spoke about it way, uh, most of its pages are referring to the days that we're living in right now. And how wonderful it is to realize that Jesus has made it possible for us to have this bright future. We're also uh, aware that when Jesus resurrected, it was a guarantee of our resurrection. So when we face death, we do not face it like others who have no hope. For God has made it possible to, for us to recognize that there will be a day coming when our loved ones who have died in Christ will also be resurrected. Now, mm -hmm. the last point. When did the time of the end begin? Daniel makes reference of that in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. 
And he, one of the saints, said to me, Daniel, for 2,300 days, then that sanctuary shall be cleansed. So he, Gabriel, came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said unto me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, we're not going to go through a deep dive in terms of what the 2300-day prophecy is. We may do that another time, but for right now, let me just say that it concluded in 1844. So since that time period, we have been in the end of time. Hey, there's no more prophecies in the Bible after this time. We are already aware that Christ has made it possible for us to look forward with great anticipation his return. And so now, we on the stage, in the audience, and those who are listening can take what um, what uh, Daniel has to say in Daniel 2.44 to heart. He says, And in the days of the kings, the king of God of heaven will set up a new kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to a new heaven and a new earth that John speaks about in Revelations 21, 1 through 5, where the old things have passed away, and we will be able to have this eternity. And it's only possible because the promised one that was given to Adam and to Abraham and all of the patriarchs and prophets have now been realized in the arrival Man. of Jesus Christ. Yes. So, uh, uh, Dr. Jackson, how has he spoken to us as well in these latter days? Okay. I want to um, begin by um, connecting um, the, some of the Old Testament with the New Testament stuff. Um, all of us are going to be dealing with Hebrews 1, yes. verses 1 through 4. And there's a lot packed in that in that. Those, these verses. Um, but the first thing that I see here, um, as Brother Rodriguez says, Hebrews 1 says, in the past, God spoke to our uh, ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in the last days, he spoke to us by his son. And then it goes on to say whom he appointed heirs, and somebody else is going to talk about that part. But I want to say that the book of Hebrews opens with the thought that God is a great communicator. Amen. Um, God is relationship-focused. And in being relationship-focused, he wants a, a certain relationship with us. He created us to have a relationship with him. And in being relationship focused, he communicates. Um, when he made Adam and Eve, he started, I can imagine he started communicating with them. The Bible tells us that he would meet with them in the cool of the evening. Yes, he does. Um, and I can imagine that he talked to them about the tree of life, about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he told them about the things they should do and should not do. He was building and holding on to that relationship. But then they didn't listen to him, and they sinned. And when they sinned, they broke the communication. How do we know this? Because when God came to meet them in the cool of the day, as the Bible says, where were they? They had hidden someplace. <laughs> um, and broken communication, um, it, it just, uh, a relationship s suffers when the communication breaks. But God still wanted to communicate Amen. with them. And we know this because he said, hey, where are you? I, I need to, to talk to you. 
and he talked to them, they sinned. He was not willing to cut that relationship with Praise them. Praise the Amen. Lord. Um, and as he was talking to them, in Genesis 3, he promised them a savior. Amen. He promised them a savior. He said, I can fix this separation in our relationship. I'm sending a son, as um, Brother Rodriguez talked about. I am sending a son, and he will destroy Satan. Thank um, you, Jesus. And so Hebrews is saying all through the ages, God spoke the same message to our to the prophets, and we can't go through all of them. But Isaiah talks about it. Moses talks about it in Deuteronomy. David talks about this promised son in uh, the song. Micah talks about it. Daniel talks about it. Zechariah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. And so God is saying over and over to humankind, I'm going to fix this sin problem. And then, and then he sends his son and he speaks to us through his son. And he's speaking the very same message. When Jesus came to us, Jesus said, I am the fulfillment of this promise. And how do we know this? Because he says in John 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He also says in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. What a message of hope that God is giving us through his son, Jesus. And he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation, God is giving us this message of hope. Jesus came and he gave us the same message because he was God Amen. who came. He was God's son, but he was God. And he came and he let us know what God looked like, what God acts like. What God is interested in, when you read the Gospels, you will see this. And Jesus tells us himself, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He's the self-revelation of God. And there are some other things. He came to teach us about love. My time is up. <laughs> he came... And he, God spoke to us through Jesus about love. Amen. Not keeping the commandments so much, but because of they, the Pharisees tried to trip him up with which is the greatest commandment. And you know what his answer is. He responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hangs on these two commandments. He also taught us about the kingdom of God. Um, and that it hasn't arrived yet, but he as the Messiah would usher in the kingdom of God. He taught that it is not an earthly kingdom. It's not a military or political kingdom, but that it is a relationship kingdom. 
a relationship with Jesus as king. I'm going to stop there because my time is up. <laughs> so, Brother Dawes, uh, the other part of this uh, text, he is the radiance of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. He is the radiance of the glory of God. What does that mean? Let me first start by saying Jesus was the essence of the glory of God. He says man was created in the image of God, but man is not the essence of God. He was, so here we go, um, Sister Jackson, to piggyback right where you were oh, in, yeah. in, in John 14. You stopped at John 14, 6, but I'm going to pick it up at John 14, verse 8, where Philip spoke up and said, Lord, give us just one glimpse of the Father mm. before you go, and we will be satisfied. I'm reading from the clear word. And Jesus, being somewhat disappointed with, Philip, with Philip's lack of faith, said, you mean you have been with me all this time? Mm. Yes. And, Philip, you have still don't know me. When you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. How then can you ask me to give you a glimpse of the Father? You must believe me when I tell you that I am the Father in action and the Father is living out his life in me. All things I have taught you were not just my own, but, but the Father's. It's the Father living in me who is doing all this. So believe me when I tell you that the Father would be doing everything I have done if he were here. This is to show that Jesus is truly the radiance of God. When you look at the sun, you see the brightness of the sun, the radiance of the sun. This is the only way we can really describe the relationship between God and his son. It says Jesus is the brightness, the light that comes from the glory of the majesty of God the Father. He is also the image of his person. He who has seen me have seen the Father. And that is what we are talking about this morning in the promised son. I know, Brother Carrington, a lot of us men are very proud when we have a son that looks just like us. <laughs> but it says, he, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The, Jesus was the perfect embodiment of God himself. It, some, I heard a preacher say that uh, one of the biggest problems that Jesus had was to keep his divinity in check. He had to be fighting to keep his divinity in check. And only one and maybe one or two occasions he did use it. But Jesus was the embodiment of the Father Amen. in Amen. spirit, in action, and in everything because he represented his Father. He says, there were many people who came before Jesus. John the Baptist was one of them. But yet, he was not, he, John the Baptist was not the, that light that had been promised to Adam and Eve in the garden. By the way, when Adam and Eve had their first son, they thought he was the Messiah. They thought he would have been the Messiah, but it was not. When... Isaac was born. Abram thought he would have been the Messiah, but he was not. But guess what? When Christ sent his son Jesus, he said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all, that all through him might be believed. But he was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light which was to come. 
That was the true light, which was the light given to every man coming to the world. So here we are in John, 4, John 1, 14 to 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he whom I said, He who came, comes after me is perfect before me, for he was before for he was before me, and he is willing. And his fulfillment we have all received, and grace for grace. So John was not the Redeemer, even though John was such a powerful preacher. He spoke of the one who is to come. And God, and in, as we continue... In John 1, 14, he says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So God, Jesus, was the essence of the Father. You remember when Joseph, I mean Moses, uh, met God, and he, God spoke to him, to him through the burning bush. He could only look at the burning bush, but he did, couldn't see God because man had sinned <laughs> and man had no right or privilege to see God after <clears throat> sin. You notice when after Adam and Eve sinned and God came down and spoke to them, what did they do? They hid themselves. And God spoke to man Ever since that time, in various and sundry forms, he spoke. Uh, you remember the, 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 the wind? He was in, uh, there was yes. an earthquake, uh, there was thundering, but he was not there. But he spoke to them in that still, small voice. But they still did not see him, couldn't see him. So God made the ultimate sacrifice, Amen. the ultimate sacrifice of sending his son to come in human flesh, disguised himself in human flesh in order to speak to man directly. So he says, he who com God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For it is God, it is that God who commanded the light to shine has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You know, yesterday I was driving home and listening to Science Friday. And they have various scientists that comes on from week to week explaining things. And these two guys came on last yesterday afternoon trying to describe creation. And they were just bubbling, bumbling idiots <laughs> and each one is telling each other that they're an idiot because one is believing in the big bang theory and the other one is disproving it and i'm saying all they had to do is go read the bible Amen. <laughs> and they would have had the answer because all what they were saying is just bubbling foolishness but god it says god created it and, and not only did God create, Jesus created with God. He says, in the beginning what was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And so this morning, in my portion of the lesson has to deal with the brightness of his glory. It is to show that his son, Jesus, the son of God, was the very essence of God himself. He was the radiance of his glory. And we are reminded that if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father. Amen. 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 
through whom he made the universe. In today's lesson study, we're going to see that Jesus Christ is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is um, God. I'm getting the impression here from the, this text, Hebrews uh, 1, verses 2 to 3, that the preacher, um, likely, likely Paul, is seeing in, is trying to make it clear to the new believers that the God who created the heaven and the earth is the same God who came and died for mankind. Yes. Here he's trying, he's sharing very clearly that while in the Old Testament, Moses saw what we probably could conceive as our solar system, this earth. But here the preacher of Hebrew 1 is introducing Jesus not only as the creator of this earth, but the creator of the entire universe. Mm -hmm. He is showing that all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies were created by this Jesus, who 60 years ago was born and died. Here he is also reminding the, 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 the new believers that look, while God, God really reveals himself gradually, and so while Moses in his vision some 3,000 years earlier, 2,500 years earlier, saw God as creator of the earth, this solar system, he is introducing that in the revelation, God used other prophets in sundry times and in sundry places, so as to create that holistic, so as to begin to create that whole story. But that whole story in different times by different people was not complete. That story was complete in Jesus Christ. He was the fulfillment. He was the complete story. In fact, uh, the, the amplified version reads it uh, as such. Has in these last days spoken with finality to us in the person of one who is by his character and nature, the, his son, namely Jesus, whom he appointed here and lawful owner of all things, through whom also he created the universe, that is, the universe in its completeness as a space-time matter continu continuum. So it is the revelation of Jesus Christ that helps us understand the total creation that was done by Jesus himself. Now, one of the things we need to understand here is that Jesus was from the foundation of the world. In fact, Isaiah 9 says that he is the eternal father or the, fa uh, the father of eternity. Everything that existed um, was through him and by him everything uh, is sustained. Jesus is not only, did not only cre Jesus not only created us, but also he continues to sustain us. Every breath, every heartbeat, and every moment of our existence is found in Jesus. Jesus is the foundation of all created existence. There is no doubt that the one who, that one, that incarnate one, that incarnate one born as a son, that he was there from the creation. And not only that, because he died, he now becomes a, a, the heir also. The price was paid and he's also now the heir. So when we would have been, when we would have surrendered our heart to Jesus Christ and all things are restored, Jesus Christ is going to receive that again as it was from the first of the foundation of the earth. Everything is his and everything is sustained by him. Yeah. One, of the, one, of the, one of the challenges here sometimes we, we experience, I guess the people of that time was experiencing also, the Bible always spoke about the triune, about, it always talked about the plurality of God, who let us create, let us create. When, when they, now when they, when they have to reconcile, 
uh, this Jesus, this born Jesus, this incarnate, this incarnate uh, person, they, it was challenging, I guess, at that time for them to reconcile Jesus present, Jesus from the foundation. But here the, the preacher is saying, look, he is the fulfillment. He's a totalness. He's a totalness of that story you ever heard from all the prophets. Mm -hmm. Jesus is that person. Uh, let us worship him. Let us understand that he died so that we can be restored. And in the end, God is going to hand back this new world back to Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. Amen. 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 Our lesson uh, today is about the promised son. And Hebrews tells us that the promised son would come in the latter days. It also says that the promised son would speak to us in a more superior manner than the prophets of old. The promised son would also be the express image of God. And then the promised son is also the one who is the creator. All these things point to none other than Jesus Christ. But in verse 5 of Hebrews 1, the word of God says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Amen. Today I've begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. We are <laughs> facing a quandary here because we're talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That is something that is hard for us to relate to because no one else in the history of the planet has ever been incarnate. Mm. Now there are religions who speak about incarnation, but not in this sense. And so what we are faced with is that Jesus is the product, if you will, to use human language, of an earthly mother and a heavenly father. Now, when you read the word of God in Matthew, there is a genealogy of Joseph, his, we would say, stepfather, because Joseph did not father Jesus Christ. Yes, but when you go over into Luke chapter 3, there is another genealogy. And although it referenced Joseph, it really is the genealogy of Mary, his mother. The point being that both of these genealogies point to Adam, it points to Abraham, it points to David. And so when Jesus arrives here, his incarnation is to fulfill prophecy. Therefore, if he's a son... It begs the question, who is his father? And here in Hebrews is referencing that God himself is his father. We have other examples. You remember that when he was baptized and there was a voice from heaven, not an audible voice from a human being that says, this is my beloved son in whom I well please. You recall that at the Mount of Transfiguration, when there was Moses and Elijah and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. So the identity of Jesus Christ is very important because some will say he was a good man. Others will say he was a great prophet. But many sometimes struggle with the reality that he is, in fact, the son of God. So the word of God needs to be examined to understand the nature of Jesus. Let's look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. So we see here that Jesus had an identity that was above any other uh, prophet or great person that had come. Elder Rodriguez? Yes, sir. Can I, in the, in the few minutes we have left, I think we have about two or three minutes left, maybe five minutes. Um, it, let's talk a little bit about the establishment of Jesus that Paul was putting out, saying that he is higher than the angels. But would there come a time when he is lower than the angels by his incarnation? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? When he died on the cross, yeah. <laughs> he was lower than the angels because he was the, despic he was the most despicable of men. Yes. 
But bear in mind, that's not because of his own actions. It's because of your actions. And it's because of my action. So he took this role of being the, the son of God. <laughs> and yet, allowing himself to be humiliated. And we'll read more about that as we study Hebrews in terms of his act. So yes, in that act, uh, Dr. Carrington, he was lower than yeah. angels. Yeah, I would say that at no point was he lower than the angels. He was God. Yes. But he took on a role. Yes. Um, he took on a role that was lower than the angels. But he was God. Okay, man. I've got a, I've got a challenge. Um, somewhere along the line, when we hear that Jesus is the Son of God. Some people seem to be interpreting that from eternity, it was God, a Father, and a Son, as if God gave birth to Jesus. I'm not yes. certain if that is correct. Let's go with that. Um, yeah. There were the, tr the Trinity, the triune, the plurality of the Godhead. Um, there are uh, three coexisting equal ones. Right. It is in that incarnate position that be, gee, no, uh, I don't remember seeing it anywhere in the Old Testament, except for the plurality, that I heard the word son. But it's when we come to the birth, the, this, this, this reincarnate position, that uh, the stature, his, 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 his reference is to that of a son of God. Right. And I like what, uh, what uh, Brother Joseph just spoke about, because it is a promised son that was told to us in the beginning. Amen. And so because of that, we have this idea, and they did too, that the son was going to come from Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They thought Cain was going to be mm -hmm. the promised son. Mm -hmm. And then when Cain didn't bring that about, and Abraham was called out, they thought Isaac might be the promised son. And then when David was chosen and all of that, because God called him a man after his own heart, then God said he would give him a promised son who would reign forever. So all these, all these prophecies speak about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But just like many then struggled with that whole concept, today we also may find it hard to actually believe that the Son of God came down to this planet to make it possible that all mankind might be saved. And that is why this promised Son is so critical for yes. us to understand, embrace, and hold dear into our hearts. All right, one final thing on the question that you asked, Brother Carrington, and as I thought about it, could it be that the word son is being used for us yes. as human beings to understand <laughs> yeah. what went on between God and Christ? Because, you know, we, uh, it's easier for us to understand that God had a son that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, did his work. So, but... And let me close with this final application, life application that we have here. It says, there's a, there's a if, if we could just make time, there's a question for one in the audience. If you could speak while you're moving. <laughs> Yes. Yes. The lesson is that angels could not redeem us. The other men, um, Adam's thinking that his son or Abraham with Isaac, because we belong to God. Yes. 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 There's no way for me to redeem something that belongs to Sister Bennett. Yes. We belong to God, and only God could redeem us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 You should have spoke up earlier. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, life application. As a personal being, God has revealed himself in his son, G Jesus. Jesus, the outstanding, the outshining of his father's glory, 
and the express image of his person was an earth found in fashion as a man. As a personal savior, he came to the world. As a personal savior, he ascended on high. As a personal savior, he intercedes in the heavenly courts. Christ, the light of the world, veiled, in, veiled the dazzling splendor of his dignity and came, veiled it, which means hid his, the dazzling splendor of his dignity, and came to live as a man among men, that they might, without being consumed, become acquainted with the Creator. Amen. Yes. That's important. He yielded himself in the splendor of, of its dignity and came to live as a man among men that they might, without being consumed, become acquainted with their God. Yes. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for your love, your care. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ. That relationship, father-son relationship, oh great God, we sometimes don't understand it. That in his in your image he lived. Our relationship on this earth, our father-son relationship, humanly speaking, needs some strengthening. We need some restoration of what it is to be a good father. What is it to honor our father's sons? As children of thine, O oh great God, we come and ask for divine strength, divine uh, insight, so that we may understand your love, your fatherly care, and we will live in your image so that the world can see us. When they see us, they'll see you, your glory shining through us. We thank you for the opportunity to live for you. We thank you for restoration, O oh great God. And someone wants to experience a little bit more of knowing what a true father's love is. Touch that heart. That depth of relationship that he, Jesus had with you, God. Each of us desire to attain it. Ful fulfill your divine purpose in our lives. May your glory shine. And this world born to call you blessed. So that Jesus' is heir of all things will receive us. In the heaven made new, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you, sir. When Bino turned three, his mom decided that she wanted him to go to an international school in Timor-Leste. An international school is not like a regular public school. Going to a public school in Timor-Leste doesn't cost any money, and the teachers speak Portuguese. Going to an international school, however, costs money, and the teachers speak English. Bino's mom wanted him to learn English, so she asked his dad to find an international school in Dili, the capital of Timor-Leste where they lived. Bino's dad found several international schools, but they were all too expensive. Then he walked past a Seventh-day Adventist church. He saw a sign on the church fence advertising the Timor Adventist International School. A phone number was on the sign, and he called for more information. To his delight, he learned that they could afford to send Bino to the school. Bino's parents were not Adventist, but they had heard about Adventists before. His mom's uncle was an Adventist. Bino started to study at the Adventist school. He quickly began to learn English, and because of him, his mom did too. Every day when Bino came home from school, she asked him to teach her the English words that he was learning at school. Hello, said Bino. Hello, his mom repeated. Goodbye, Bino said. Goodbye, she repeated. As the weeks and months passed, their English lessons grew more complicated. I love you, Bino said. I love you, his mom exclaimed. English was not the only thing that Bino taught her after school. Every day, Bino heard Bible stories from his teachers, and he told his mom about David and Goliath, Jonah and the big fish, and Jesus and the little boy whose lunch fed more than 5,000 people. She loved hearing her little boy tell Bible stories. Bino's parents began reading the Bible. 
Sometimes they had questions about what they were reading, so they talked with the pastor of the Adventist church near Bino's school and an American missionary who also lived on the island. The pastor and the missionary visited Bino's house regularly. The day came that Bino's parents were baptized and joined the Adventist church. Today, Bino not only goes to the Adventist school, but his parents go to the school too. They work as the school's caretakers. Because of the school, the whole family now speaks English. But more importantly, they love Jesus with all their hearts. A few years ago, part of the 13th Sabbath offering helped to open the Adventist school in Dili. This quarter, the 13th Sabbath offering will help build a dormitory so children from faraway villages can study and live at the school. Thank you for giving to this special offering. Thanks for joining us in our interactive Sabbath School class today. We appreciate your participation both live and virtually. Join us next week as we continue to discuss the message of Hebrews. As we continue to study, we hope that you will increase your love and admiration for Christ. Stay tuned for the next portion of our service.